This episode of the Digital Instruction Network is sponsored by Ramsey Association of Michigan. For more than 50 years, they have been providing digital media services as well as educator professional learning to educators and schools all over the state of Michigan. For more information on their programs, including the 21 Things program, the Classroom Makers program, and play dates, please visit remc.org. That's R-E-M-C.org. Well, welcome back. This is 517 EdTech's Digital Instruction Network. I am Andrew Schauber, Instruction Technology Coach at Ingham ISD, joined, as always, by the legendary Christy Lobdell, Assistive Technology at Eaton Risa, and Allison Rogers, a.k.a. Allison the Great, Instructional Technology up at Clinton County Risa. And today, we are joined by two high school math teachers, Dave Schmidt and Chris Tyler, both out of Waverly High School in Lansing, Michigan. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Go Warriors. Or, indeed. And today we are going to talk about the, uh, the challenge and opportunities that remote instruction has brought to the uh, fine art of teaching math. Um, teaching math is, is uh, an interesting endeavor. I've done it myself. I did it for almost 10 years. And the remote instruction, which Waverly has uh, been very stable in their instructional model. They went with remote instruction very early and uh, have stayed that way the whole time, which has been very interesting. It's allowed uh, Dave and Chris to both really hone that mode of instruction. I think it's going to be really interesting uh, for, as they share kind of what their experiences have been and what they have found some success with. Uh, so today, what we kind of want to talk about um, is how that initial uh, transition had to happen. So once, once you realize that your classroom instruction is going to have to transition to a fully remote setting, what does that look like? And what were some of the things that you had to kind of uh, guess and check and get better at as you went along? Also, we're going to talk about the, the technology that they lean on most heavily and how well that's working for them. We want to talk about feedback, too, which is something that was really interesting in our, in our preliminary conversation, the way that they use feedback and how heavily they have to uh, rely on that as a, as a way to make sure that the students are keeping up with uh, some of the new content they have to teach. And then we're going to talk about risk-taking and uh, student engagement as well. So I am, I am confident this is going to be a very interesting conversation um, I've been looking forward to this one. So Dave, Chris, thanks a bunch for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so why don't you uh, talk a little bit um, about sort of what things look like for you right now, how that kind of compares to what you were up to before and, uh, and just some of the experiences you're having sort of day to day at the moment. Well, for me, um, it's, I, I guess, a lot different. Um, I like to float around the room. I'm usually in the room and I have an iPad and I project up on the screen. So I'm walking around a lot and interacting quite a bit and looking over shoulders. And so I just don't get that in this environment. And so for me, it was, how can I find a way to, to at least understand where they're at and get that, you know, knowledge of how, how well they're taking in the information and then giving them the feedback. So that was the, the big trick. And I think, you know, through some of the things we'll talk about today, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Yeah, and I uh, I started out my even last year at the beginning of the year using Google Classroom. I was pretty comfortable with that, but then we went remote like that March 12th, 13th, whatever date it was, and I fell flat on my face. Like I was recording videos and doing everything that I normally would do, but I wasn't getting any feedback from students or you know how that give and take happens in a classroom, especially in math. Like, you know, you ask a question and you try and get some responses from them. And I, I wasn't getting that at the beginning last year, but, you know, it was kind of, we were just thrown into it and try and figure it out. And, it, yeah. and we came up with some great techniques and strategies to use this to, to start the school year off with this, with this year. You know, one of the things that's interesting, Chris mentioned this and, and, and Dave, you alluded to it as well, was just the, the, the act of wandering around the room, like the, 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 the handful of things you're doing while you're doing that, that that's not a, a, that is a fairly complex uh, exercise in a classroom. It's to wander around the room because you're, you're checking that the students are actively engaged. 
you're looking at what they're doing to monitor the, the effectiveness of what they're practicing. You are also by proximity controlling the classroom management um, you're gaining an understanding based on the observations of their body language, how much stress this is causing them, how comfortable they're feeling, how hard you can push them. All of these things are happening. Plus, they're getting these little opportunities to just kind of play this real, real quick. Can you just you show me this real quick? And having those little moments that like are not disruptive to anybody and they feel awfully comfortable having those, all of that is lost by not being able to just simply wander around the room. It feels like you're just losing one thing. I just got to wander around the room. No, when I'm wandering around the room, I'm doing 10 things almost. All 10 of those things have to be restructured to try and figure out what that looks like in a remote setting. Yes. Or even just, you know, what page are we on? Oh, it's, you know, this or, <laughs> but yeah. those little, those little moments, that's what we're missing in this environment quite a bit is just, you know, Hey, can you just show me this real quick? And there's none of that happening right now. And um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that, that organic chemistry that you just have in a classroom where you can walk around and see a kid not on the right page and just flip it two pages to where we're supposed to be. And, and you know, having those tiny interactions is definitely interesting now, the situation that we're in. Yeah, you can actually physically see that someone <clears throat> doesn't have their book. And then you're like, wait a minute, in this environment, I went weeks and then I found out certain students didn't have a book. I'm like, what, how did you not get a book? You know? Right. <laughs> and I, you know, students themselves rely on that so much too. Students have learned strategies for, all right, if I don't know what I'm doing, I need to look at this person. They're going to help me out. And coming from the special ed world, that's something we teach our kids to say, like, look around the room. There's going to be something posted. There's going to be you know, that kid who knows what they're doing, look around the room and use those cues to help you get on track. And they lost all of that on March 13th. So, But I think they've gained some different techniques now to utilize and get that, like before phones, we couldn't see them. You know, if I, if I saw it, I took it in my classroom because you're distracted. But now I, I have no clue whatsoever, but that doesn't mean that it's not beneficial to them. Like they could be texting a friend, like what page am I supposed to be on and get the help that way as well. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, so what have you guys done about that? I mean, like we just, I mean, we just enumerated all of these things that are super important that we can't do anymore, but you can't just say, okay, well, I can't give my students opportunities to ask a simple question. Okay. I can't find, Never mind. I guess I just won't monitor their engagement. You know what I'm saying? So like, how did you, how did you adjust? What'd you yeah, do? Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested to hear like kind of the progression because I really appreciate that you said, Dave, that like in March, you even though had the content, you fell on your face because of that interaction piece, the feedback piece. So I would love to hear kind of the progression because I can't imagine it suddenly just being perfect right out the gate. But like, can you tell us a story of maybe what helped, what didn't go so right and you tweaked and then now you're feeling better about it? Well, I will be the biggest cheerleader for Pear Deck. Um, I started using it at the beginning of this school year. I had never heard about it before. It was one of those, hey, why don't we give you some training on this technique and see how it goes? And I fell in love with it. And what it is, is you take your PowerPoint that you use. I always have like PowerPoints for my classroom to help my guide my instruction so that I know I want to ask this question on this page this question on this page and I keep the kids, you know, organized as much as I can be. So, but on my PowerPoint now, I can include a box for them to type when I ask a question. So when I have a, a problem that they need to solve, I'll tell them, write down your thought process and how you're solving this problem. And so I can see them as they're typing away I can see the number of students that are in the Pear Deck, the number of students that are responding to this specific question. And then I can click a button and actually show their responses of what they're actually typing in their computer, which is amazing in itself to, to get that instantaneous feedback of what their thinking is and, and have a discussion with the class about, let's look at this answer and nobody's names are attached to it. Um, so it's totally anonymous. Um, and you can talk through each of those answers and how maybe they had a correct thought or maybe 90, 
95% of mistakes that happen in math are with a negative. So you can say that and say, listen, that negative, it's going to catch you. And it probably caught half of you. Now they're going back and fixing it um, even before I get to their statement. So they make sure they corrected that mistake as well. I'm going to steal that line. I like that. <laughs> um, if Dave's the biggest fan of Pear Deck, I'll be the second biggest because that's immediately what I jumped to. And, um, you know, it was, we were a little lucky, I guess, to have those couple of months there at the end of the school year to do exactly that and fall flat on our face and say, okay, well, we have to rethink some things. We did a lot of training over the summer and I felt like we were at least somewhat ready. But the biggest thing that I noticed back in March was that I had students that I had really good relationships with and the engagement just nosedived and, you know, they weren't showing up. They weren't even, you know, talking, they didn't want to come on camera. And obviously that, you know, when September hit or August hit and you get a whole new batch of students, nobody wanted to unmute themselves and, and talk. And so Pear Deck gives a great way to meet them at that level and just behind the scenes, I can be typing feedback in and I tell the students, hey, even if you don't know the answer, if you have no clue where to start, put that in the Pear Deck and then I can see it. And then now I can maybe get you started. Yeah. So it's, it's really worked well. Yeah. Find some way to signal the difference between, <laughs> I don't know what to do and I'm disengaged. Like I'm fully engaged, but I, but I just don't know what to do. Yes. So, right. You know, Cause now it's not just that you need to um, be explicit with your instruction because you're in a virtual environment, but they have to be explicit with their own communication to you and their own feedback to you because we don't have those little side conversations, those little moments when you're walking around the classroom. And so that's a skill in and of itself that you probably had to teach kids was like, I know you're probably not used to being this transparent with how you're feeling or, or if you're lost or if you're with me, but yeah. there's, this is the only way that I'm going to be able to fully support you in the way that I can. And so um, I think that's a really important skill right. uh, to have taught and to facilitate and model. Yeah, and the trickiest thing in AP Calculus when, when you're teaching this is they have, um, at the end of the year, they have an AP test that if they pass, they get college credit for, and there's open response questions. So not only do you have to find an answer, but then you have to write a statement and a thought about what this answer actually means. So this Pear Deck idea and having them have to think through, write out every single complete thought on, on how they're doing this problem has actually helped me in teaching them the open response portion of the test because now every time they have a question, they have to type out all their thoughts and how they yeah. get that answer. Yeah, and yes. that's just, that's practice, right? I mean, it was the kind of thing I, I taught. I did teach math. I also taught a little bit of science and I would force the students to use the words. Like you've got to use these three words. So I want you to explain uh, how this situation reflects Newton's third law, but you've got to use the three words, force, motion acceleration and and then that way they they can't you got to push them into the situation where they've got to do the thing that they need that you need to tell if they can do like i know i i don't need to hear you explain this thing as much as i need you to hear the, whether or not you understand what acceleration has to do with newton's third law so i'm going to force you to use both those words together and then if it's nonsense i understand that there's a misunderstanding as opposed to you using the words you have to say something that's fairly reasonable, but doesn't give me the window into whether or not you understand how acceleration is related to Newton's third law. In what your case is, right, at some point, we've got to be able to do the calculus, and that's true, but there's this added piece to it that we can't get around, and so we may as well get in the habit of using our words mathematically in addition to simply being able to calculate and, and compute and graph. You've got to be able to talk about it too, using real math vocabulary. Yeah, so many times kids just want the answer. Like, how do I get the answer? But you need to understand what the answer actually is and, and that what define it, it, being able to explain what that answer is. Like, yeah, you got 220. What does that mean? Right. Does that mean it's 220 per item? Or right. is that the total number, uh, you know, like, so mm -hmm. having that pair that conversation and having that complete thought, now you understand it's $200 per item as opposed to just a total of 200 bucks. Yes. And, you know, to piggyback on that, I guess, looking at graphs come to mind, you know, oh, it's going up. Well, what do you mean it's going up? What are you seeing? And you tell me it's more specific, like it's going up over here or what's that? Yeah. <laughs> 
from left to right it's oh that's what you meant you know right right and it's it's going up like you've got you've got units there that we can describe too yeah yes by how much right yeah, yeah. I, lo I love this conversation for many reasons, one of which being a former English teacher. I love it when anytime the written word can be translated so cohesively, cross-curricularly, right? Um, being able to explain yourself is a skill that translates you know, beyond just English class. Um, so I guess I'm curious what other tools you've used to facilitate that, whether it was in the written word format or a different modality, you know, maybe recording themselves to provide feedback to you to be able to showcase whether or not they've, you know, learned what they need to learn or, or mastered what, you know, the skill that you're working on. Also, for the record, I think Allison was just simply impressed that three math teachers can start talking that she would actually find what we were saying interesting. <laughs> I think that's, that's right. Really we did it. This is a success. <laughs> Cut it right here. We achieved. A high watermark. That's right. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I have, well, I'm going to do a video assignment, I should say, like a real one. And so that will be interesting to see their, their feedback or their, their, excuse me, their thinking. And, um, but I've also done, you know, hey, write it out, just old school, write it out, upload it to slides and show me that you can solve this problem and show me the steps. And so I've, I've graded that. It's a lot to look at and grade and do over Google Classroom, but it seemed to work pretty well and I could see exactly where they go wrong and, oh, you don't understand, you know, the rules of solving an equation or whatever it is, but, um, and I'll give them that feedback right in Google Classroom, so that's been uh, nice. Yeah, me too, and uh, even like my final exam, I'm teaching for the first time this year a stock market math class, so I'm teaching about the stock market, and really my final exam was tell me what you learned over the semester using these key terms. Then they had to compare and contrast what day trading, be, be, uh, day trading versus investing. So they had to write short paragraphs in a Google form. And then I just put it on a spreadsheet, correct it. Um, the last question was, what did you like about this semester? So I got a little feedback on myself as well and what I did well. And I, I, apparently I need to slow down. I, I talk a little too fast sometimes. So um, using that feedback for myself in my classroom is awesome too. But with the, with the Google form, it, you can put it all in a spreadsheet so you can see everybody's answers right in line, kind of see common mistakes that happen or I, I, oh, look at this. I must have taught what a stop is wrong because everyone, when we talk about entry, exit, and stop loss, the stop loss was lost. <laughs> so <laughs> I went back, it was actually my first day of the first new semester and we talked about it and, and we reviewed what, what that was because obviously I did not a stellar job the first semester on it. But, but the Google form is great because they all submitted it. And then once again, like Chris was saying, you can use um, the Google Classroom and give feedback back individually and really talk to them. Yeah, and on that note, I'll say that this environment has sort of forced us to use all this tech for tests and quizzes, and you get that data by question, and you can see, a lot, I'm getting a lot more data to understand exactly that. Like, I can pinpoint, oh, number seven was a problem. Let, let's now talk about that one in the next class or whatever. Absolutely, using that feedback to inform the next day or the next yeah. piece of instruction is such an invaluable um, component of teaching. And I think it's always kind of been there to a degree with so much of our technology, but I love that uh, people are really, you know, just embracing that aspect of not, okay, I have to use technology because this is the environment we're in, but like, I'm going to use it and I'm going to use it for all of the great things it can offer. And um, I think that with the data piece, sometimes that word can just sort of scare people off, but Gosh, I mean, granted, you guys are math folks, so you, you've <laughs> always embraced it. But um, I love hearing that, you know, it's not it's just being used even in a different way for even for you math guys. So when you've got all of your students answers in digital form, the error analysis opportunities, when you can then turn that problem anonymously around and say, here's one of the answers I got yesterday. And maybe it's whatever class. It doesn't even matter whose it was. Maybe you said it, saw the same thing 10 times. It doesn't matter. Just here's one I got. For our warm-up today, I want you to uh, 
pick out what's right about it, pick out what's wrong about it, and then write one sentence that you would give the person who wrote this to help them fix it up. And there's some written word right there, but like you've got such a, a, a plentiful supply of artifacts now because everything's digital. It's all digital. Yeah, so you could get to that, you know, when you're grading 100 papers or whatever, you could get to that anecdotally, I guess. You could see, well, I remember this from going through the grades, right. but now you have it. Your phone, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> now it's exact. Uh, in the Google sheet, I actually color coded. If it was if it was correct, I made it green. And if it's wrong, I made it red. So you could see like in the line and, and keep the anonymous, like I don't ever look at the names because they're so far to the left. I just go down the answers. So that helps as well, like not having bias towards students. You're just correcting whatever answer is there and whoever's it is like, um, but yeah, just seeing that red and going and the next thing, the clipping tool, being able to just to clip a box on your screen and yes. just show it up as, 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 so the students can see it and be like, listen, I, I don't know what happened here, but let's talk about this problem because you see all this red, that yeah. everybody got this one wrong. So let's I, have a conversation. I love your approach to that because you're being super transparent as a teacher, but just hearing you both speak about it's not what did they miss necessarily, but you're saying almost like what, what didn't I maybe teach in the way that I could have, or I taught it this way, but clearly not getting it. So let me reframe that. I just, I love that you're owning your feedback in a non-threatening way, but you're harnessing that to then improve and change your instruction. And in additionally, having that um, just feedback about, hey, how did this semester go? Um, that, that can be a scary thing as a teacher, you know, providing a survey of like, let's just reflect, especially if you're like, so what didn't go so great this year, you know, and, and it's anonymous. And so people can say, but I think that that's also another really powerful way to use feedback. And, you know, you're always going to get those kids that are going to maybe say some goofy things, but then you're also going to get those kids that are going to tell you stuff that like you really need to hear and makes your heart happy to hear too. So good for you guys. That's, that's a hard thing to do, but a really important thing to do. You know, so many things that you guys are doing are allowing our students to, or your students to take risks. And I feel like even more so digitally or in this virtual world, than they would be able to in person because, you know, it's only them on the other side of the computer and um, they're doing their work, just them. There's nobody around them, like looking at their paper, like, oh my gosh, their paper is blank. They don't know what they're doing, but you guys are also giving them instant feedback, especially through Pear Deck um, saying they're not going through this whole um, assignment just to say like, oh my gosh, I got two of these 10 questions correct. They're getting feedback right away on that one problem to say, all right, I'm not wasting my time because I'm immediately getting the information that I need to con continue the assignment, this assignment correctly. So in some ways, I almost feel like your students are able to take more risks digitally and through virtual instruction than they are, you know, right within the classroom because of the feedback that you guys are giving them and because you're creating this safe place for them to take the risks that they need in order to learn the content. So I know, um, you know, through some of the other programs that you guys are going to talk about, that's also possible, but I especially think so with uh, the Google Forms assessments that you're doing and with Pear Deck, so. Well, and in addition to that too, like Dave's practice that he was saying of being able to like internalize the fact that like everybody got this one wrong or a huge chunk of us got this one mm -hmm. wrong also gives the students, once they get that as part of the routine, then they recognize that it's it's even less. They weren't the only ones. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so like get be wrong so that he knows we don't understand. Like and he's not going to that like that's not going to come back on you at all, because if half the class got it wrong. Right. You've seen Mr. Schmidt 100 times say, well, that was probably me. Like you guys and we're not going to just move on to the next lesson or to the next unit. We're going to take some time to reflect right. on what learning occurred and what learning didn't occur. And let's not move on until we've talked about it um, and, and made that learning that we intended to happen actually occur. Yeah, and your me students and appreciate that, I'm sure. Me and Mr. Tyler are both part of TLT, which is Teachers Learning Together. And one of our mantras for this is, uh, mistakes and wrong answers are opportunities for growth and learning. 
So I want mistakes. I, you're going to learn more from a mistake you made than just doing it right every time and really making that mistake and saying, well, why did I do it? What, what did I do wrong so that I don't do it again? Um, I, for us, I think is more beneficial. And I'm sure Tyler will piggyback on this, but we're really positive oriented, um, positive affirmations. Like we want to do things and correct things through positive affirmation. Like, Hey, just volunteer. We'll give you extra points or we'll get, I give candy out in my class. Unfortunately can't do it digitally, but you know, like here's a Schmidt buck, you know, Clearly, like, you haven't seen Willy Wonka. <laughs> we're able to push it through the TV. Yeah. Yeah. I wish that technology existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tried to set that expectation with my students right away. I, I had them take a, a course on you cubed, uh, you cubed, Dot org, I believe. And it's That's through Joe Stanford. Bowler. Yes, Joe Bowler. And it walks them through. It's like six lessons. It takes, you know, a few hours to get through. So it was a big assignment for them in the beginning of the school year. And it shows them the science of making those mistakes and that your brain literally grows when you make those mistakes. And I just try to talk that up. And I, I constantly am finding that I'm referencing that this is the first year I've done it. But I'm going back and like, remember that, you know, mistakes make your brain grow and you know it just kind of going back this is what we talked about in that youtube course and um i find it helpful but just having that environment is is key and allows them to to go and take those risks so okay so we've, we've covered pear deck we've we've early we haven't covered it but we, we talked about pear deck we talked about google classroom what are some other tools that you guys are uh, making good use of that you think are making a positive difference I have uh, flipped my classroom quite a bit. I wouldn't say 100%, but very close. So I've done a lot of Edpuzzle videos. And what I like about Edpuzzle is that I can do a short video, eight minutes usually, 10 minutes maybe. Um, and then I'll sometimes have to do two videos a day, but I'll do a couple videos here and there and it'll be the core lesson. Just let's get through what you need to get through and I'll show them examples and things. And then at the end, there's there's the ability to have a question in there and it gives them the chance to respond either multiple choice or if it's multiple choice, I can put some feedback in there and say, Oh, you got this wrong. You fell into this trap or whatever. Uh, I say it nicer, but you know, so it should be said too, for the record that um, Waverly community schools has invested um, quite heavily in you guys, as far as giving you the tools you need to do this stuff. So like Pear Deck, district licenses were purchased for all teachers at the premium level. So they have that full tool available, Edpuzzle, full tool yes. available. Um, yes. for the, every, every teacher in the district. And that was one of the decisions they made. Like we're going to, okay, we're going to go fully remote and we're going to stay that way for a while. We're going to have to equip these teachers with the tools of the trade so that they're able to create what they need for their students. And so it's, it's, I think it's really telling that the tools that you're referencing as being some pretty useful tools happen to be the tools that they also said, look, we're not going to like leave you guys hung out to dry here. Like we're going to take good care of you, get, make sure that you've got a, a 21st century toolbox to teach in this 21st century environment. Yeah, they've been great about that. And we, you know, right away it was Ed Puzzle and Pear Deck. And so I immersed myself and tried to learn as best as I could, but I've been really happy with both of those. So for AP Calculus, uh, I've got some independent study kids, which would have been sitting in class with the AB students, they're BC, so they're doing a little bit more um, content wise. So they're doing an independent study and they would have been in my classroom. I would have been able to communicate, have those conversations that we normally would. Um, with this year being a little different, it, it's, it's much more challenging. So I've been using Khan Academy and I can literally assign them an entire curriculum, whether it be Algebra 1, Geometry, AP Calculus AB versus BC, depending on the student. Um, and it goes through and you can individually assign things or just give them the, all the content that there is. So I actually, for my calculus students, give them pieces at a time so that they're not overwhelmed with all the information they need to cover. We're just going to do this today and here's one assignment, or we're going to do this today. Here's two or three assignments. And there are five questions. They have to get, I think, four out of five. I base it off of a 10 point scale. So if they get them all, they get 10 points. If not, they get either 8.5, 7.5, whatever their score is. Um, 
but making sure that they're getting that knowledge and every question that they have, if they get a wrong answer, or even if they don't, you can click on a hint and it takes them step by step on how to solve the problem. And if you want more, you can click on a video and watch a video over that problem as well. But this is my favorite thing from Desmos. I love this activity. I make sure anytime I have to do trig, I am doing this activity. This is an inverted sign function. But what you're going to do is you're going to learn what all of these different things do. So this orange button, this green button, and this purple button all do different things. So when we talk about the different um, variables that are on a trig function, uh, and there's numbers in front of the trig function, there's numbers inside the parentheses of the trig function, all these things do something to your graph and you're going to learn how that works through this Desmos activity. Right now, they're just playing with it and seeing all the different buttons and what they do. And through this um, Desmos activity, they actually learn which each individual variable stands for and how it works. So as they're going through, I can see what each student is thinking and what their thought process was like each of these different boxes oops sorry I clicked on it but each of these different boxes has a different student response in it um, and you can see what they did to each of their graphs and what their graph looked like as they're typing in this box and you can make it so that you don't know who is typing in this um, with this button up here so that you could show your classroom too and no one would know who's answer was what, and you can, once again, just like the Pear Deck, talk through like what happened in this problem and even pick an in, a particular student and say, let's look at this particular graph and the, what they wrote here, because I think this is a good example. So it seems like, um, you know, you have got all this training over the summer, your district provided you with some awesome tools. You have spent this whole year um, probably through a process, implementing new tools, increasing your students' um, efficiency and accuracy with using these tools. And now here we are in January, and there is a trans transition back to in-person date ahead of us. Um, I'm curious to know kind of what tools you guys are going to continue to pull in for the rest of the school year as you transition to in-person. But even beyond that, you know, potentially, hopefully, once we return to kind of normal school, um, if there are any tools that you found so helpful that you'll continue to use once we're back to traditional uh, means of school. I can start, I guess I'll say Pear Deck once again. Um, I've used Pear Deck in the class in a live setting and I've, you know, because we're a one-to-one -one school, so everybody would have their Chromebooks out and um, I've used it, but the tendency for me was to get up and walk around and look over shoulders and get bogged down maybe answering a question versus going and sitting at my desk at least for you know a, a short amount of time to be able to look at all the answers and find those trouble spots collectively for you know 10 students or 15 students and seeing that grid view and saying okay let's talk about this let's not move on let's talk about this particular problem or at least giving some feedback in that way too because such certain students are going to be shy and not maybe want to speak up and ask that question, but I can go back to my desk and have that interaction with them. So I think I'll keep some something like that in place. And obviously in the live environment, still be able to have the best of both worlds and walk over to somebody and tell them to get going or give them a pointer. Yeah, I, I, I think about it post COVID and then I think about it going back to normal, nor uh, the new normalcy, but a little bit back to normal. And I did group work. I, I have my kids in nine different groups and they're groups of four and they're always having conversations about the math and the math problems. I don't, I, what I see in the future is still utilizing Google Classroom in my classroom because I can set up breakout rooms. Now they can talk to each other in the breakout room, but I don't have to have them in close proximity to each other to have that conversation still. So I think my groups might have to break up when I go back in the classroom and keep them separated and maybe keep the rows kind of like your old traditional classroom that drives me nuts. But I think it's good for proximity sake and keeping kids healthy. But 
I want them back in groups. I want them talking to each other. So how can I do that with Google Classroom? How can I do that with Pear Deck? I can't wait to get back, but I'm definitely bringing Pear Deck with me. Because think about that. Once they answer the question in Pear Deck, then I can bring it up on my screen and start talking about these answers that these kids have. And nobody knows whose answer is what. Like, who, who cares? Let's talk yeah. about what answer is here and talk about maybe a mistake that happened or what a great solution looks like. And, and are you going to start mimicking what that great solution is? Yeah, when I was, when I was teaching, I would walk around uh, with, I had an iPad. All my students, we were one-to-one also, but my students would be working and um, I'd have an iPad and they just got used to uh, seeing me say, hold on, hold, hold on a second. And I would snap a photo of their work and then I would trim it so that it didn't have names or any identifying characteristics. And then I would upload it to Google Drive so that it was at my computer and then I could pump it up to my projector. And I had to do this. This was routine. I mean, I was doing this 10 times a day in every classroom during guided practice time. Because I did not have a tool like Pear Deck. I didn't have something that would very quickly translate all of that. I had to rig that whole thing up where I was auto uploading and hoping that the internet kept working right and all that stuff. And so I'm a huge fan of that idea of taking the student's work and showing it back to them. Sometimes it's a right answer. Sometimes it's an interesting mistake. Sometimes it's an answer that is like really close, but the answer's totally off. Like the procedure, one small mistake made a huge difference. And so like if all these interesting reasons why you may want the students to analyze an authentic piece of their own work. Um, and so to have a tool that can pull that move off much more efficiently than what I was doing, you know, wow. kind of creeping around my classroom, like a paparazzi <laughs> wasn't, there's gotta be a better way, right? And by 2021, there is. Uh, when using when using uh, Pear Deck, I think it's such an easy tool to use. First off, I'm logged into Google through my school account, um, which is important for me because when I need to pull down, I'm going to shift us over here. Uh, when you pull down that menu, you can see the Google Slides. You know, you come in and you have your slides. I always do a warm up question at the beginning of my class, just to just so that they can be doing something as they're coming in. So just an easy, just a math question. Sorry. Nothing to it. Just um, easy. Everybody knows this one. No, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, just a math question. Get their brains flowing. So I'm going to click on add-ons and then go to Pear Deck for Google Slides and open Pear Deck add-on. And for the and record, for those of you who are watching, if you have, if you don't have a full premium account for this, you can still totally add that add-on. It just limits the choices you get along the side, but you can still add the add-on and do some of this stuff with a free account. Excellent. So then I just click the text icon and what it will do is it'll show, um, this always pops up, it's adding that interactive question. It'll pop up down here so that you know you have it on this slide. And that's your indicator that you did put it on properly. So then we're gonna start the lesson and, I, and you can start it as student paced so they could work through this on their own and at their own speed or instructor paced. So I do it for my classroom instructor paced because I want them focused on this at this point and then we'll move on to the next slide. It, it, it makes sure that I stay on top of them and, and continuing, but I definitely have turned on student paced after like two examples, here are some more, go try them at your own pace. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do joinpd.com and down here, they've got a code for you. And they'll always use words in case you're unsure of the letter, um, but joinpd.com. So we're gonna have our guest panels, joinpd.com and they're gonna type in W-X-U-C-K-U. And I can click off this and it will put it up in the top right-hand corner. So any kid that comes late to my class still knows to look in the upper right-hand corner to find that code um, to, so that they're not lost and they know exactly what we're doing. You, you get into that routine and that practice and they're pretty quick on it. But and they'll you, still ask. Yeah. And you can see down here, um, no responses and you'll start to see people pop in. Um, so I've got two of three. So I can see people that are in here and then people that are responding to this warm up question. And like we said before, we can show what the answers are looking like. Got to shift us again. We can show what the answers are looking like. And 
in these two, you want to discuss, I see f prime of x equals 2x and f prime of x equals 2x. And these are both the right answers. But in my classroom, I want to talk about this is the first derivative of f of x, and it's labeled f prime of x equals 2x. So that's giving us that full um, picture of what's going on here, where f prime of 2 of x is the correct answer. But are you understanding what that answer actually is? And, and I'll have that discussion in my classroom and hopefully they'll start to type in exactly what we're talking about and change their answer as we go along. And then I have a record of this when the whole assignment's done. The math classroom has this unique kind of moment that, that maybe isn't as unique as I, as I think it is because I haven't spent as, as much time teaching in other subject areas, but there's this, this moment where you're, you're teaching a, a, a bit of content and then you ask the students to perform a task related to it. And you need to know in the space of two or three minutes whether they're with you or whether they're not with you. That, that's, and that's really all you need to know. I just need to, I'm, I'm three minutes. Because what I do in five minutes, it depends on how that three minutes goes. Now this interaction is very, very simple to pull off in a face-to-face -face setting. You write a problem or two on the board, you tell them to get out a sheet of scrap paper, do your best for three minutes, you know, you're looking at the clock and you just go, give it a try. Either you're gonna have it in three minutes or you're not, and I'm gonna need to, I'll know what I need to know. Remotely though, that is nowhere near as simple an interaction. It takes a tool, it takes practice, it takes routine. You know, Dave just showed us Pear Deck. Do you know how to use it smoothly enough so that this what was a three minute exercise doesn't turn into a 20 minute exercise? Have the students practiced it enough? Are you smooth enough with it and are they smooth enough with it so that if you need to give feedback, it's not only accessible, but meaningful. And you learn what you need to learn and they learn what they need to learn. And your instruction is progressing based on that really important interaction that is absolutely routine in every secondary math classroom that I've ever seen. Just here's the thing. Now turn around and just try it quickly and let's see how you're doing with it. You know, and so the idea of transferring all of that into a remote space is the story of taking these routine little activities that are highly meaningful, that are essential to the operation and figuring out what they look like digitally. And that was, that's no easy task. What's really interesting to hear you guys talk about is now that you have figured out <clears throat> how to pull that move off, you have noticed some unforeseen benefits to having that interaction digital. And that wouldn't mean that you're going to do that little thing digital all the time. But now you know that if you do it digitally, you'll get this benefit. So when it makes good sense, we're going to do this digitally. When it doesn't make good sense, we'll do it paper pencil. I've got both. I can choose which one fits best now because I'm, I'm good at using both. My students are good at using both and my toolbox has now broadened. And I think that that's going to be something that we are able to observe with lots of teachers as they re-enter the face-to-face the -face setting with their students is that their toolboxes are going to be significantly more robust than they previously were. Not only in the sense that there's no tools in it, but the tools they previously had to lean on, they've had to lean on differently and and more intensely now, so they're, they're better at using them. So I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and share all that with us. Um, I've, had a, I've had a really good time having this conversation. Thank you. All right, Christy, you wanna wrap up? Sure, this has been a great conversation. And um, you, know, you guys are math teachers at the secondary level, but a lot of the things you've talked about today can be carried over um, across grade spans, across subject areas because it's the piece about, you know, we've had a way of doing things. We were forced to change the way that we've done things because of the pandemic, but that's okay because we've learned from it. And we've also picked up on things that we are going to continue to use in the future. So this whole, um, you know, life we've lived the last 
10 months has forced us to think, okay, you know, this is how I've always done it, but why? I no longer can do it that way. I need to find new tools and holy cow, now I have this whole new set of tools. My students have this whole new set of tools that are not only benefiting my teaching um, and how I present material and how I give feedback, but it's benefiting them to um, grasp the content that I'm trying to teach them. So I think um, like Andrew said, now we'll have choices moving forward, use the tools or not, depending on the environment we're in and the content we're teaching. But um, you know, it's, I, I think back to our, one of our other um, conversationalists that we, that joined us, Abby Mer Burmeister, who said, don't let a good pandemic go to waste. You guys haven't, you guys are, you know, using each and every day to add something new to your toolbox. And, and I think your students are, are really benefiting from that. So good job. And thanks for joining us. All right, Chris. Want to wrap All right. Up? Sure. Yes. I think uh, at the end of the day, we have to have a way to find those moments um, and find the, the thinking behind what the students are doing. And two, giving them feedback to let them know, even if it's just, hey, great job, uh, having that interaction in this world, um, you know, normally you're not having that if they're not unmuting and talking. So uh, Pear Deck is a great tool for that. And then, you know, one of the other things uh, would be like a chat bomb, just getting them to put their answers in the chat and say, hey, just put it in and let me see it. And one, two, three, go. Um, one way or the other, I mean, you have to have that back and forth, especially in mathematics. Um, I can't speak to other subjects, like you said, but yeah, definitely math, you got to have that. And I'll carry this with me. I mean, I'll do homework probably different, at least on occasion, to be able to say, okay, we're gonna do this. At, it's gonna be a digital assignment. You're gonna upload your picture of your work and let me see that so we can create that back and forth offline. You know, will you go home and do that and we can have that back and forth over the course of a few days, whether it's through Google Classroom or even Pear Deck, you can do that as a homework assignment. Allison, you wanna wrap up? Sure. Um, just a couple of things to mention that I really appreciate um, how reflective you both are in your teaching, that you think through um, you know, what's happening day to day to inform the next day, the next month, the next year even. And I think that is really powerful in no matter what environment you're in. Um, I also think that you're using tools in your toolkit, whether they're actual tech tools or not, um, to you know provide the best possible instruction as possible. And you're using now some of the things you're finding to be a little bit more data driven and intentional with those pieces, uh, which then obviously provides more quality feedback that goes both ways, the student feedback and the teacher feedback. So I think you're using, um, as Christy said, you know, you're using the pandemic in, as a way to kind of perfect your craft. And I think that I'm really excited to hear how it goes when you are back in person, because I think that it's gonna translate beautifully. Dave. Want to wrap up? Sure. Uh, I just want to thank Allison, Christy, and Andrew for giving us an opportunity to come on here and talk about these great things. I know Chris and I both are, really appreciate you guys taking the time out. And I want to thank Waverly uh, Community Schools for, for giving us the Pear Deck. I, we don't have that from them. We don't have it at all. So only final thought, use Pear Deck. <laughs> Dave Schmidt and Chris Tyler, math teachers at Waverly High School in Lansing, Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, be sure to check out our full Digital Instruction Network playlist using this link. You can also check out our website here for 517 EdTech. Be sure to follow hashtag 517 EdTech on Twitter. And if you'd like to join our mailing list, click on this link and you'll be added to our email blasts.